Duncan and Holder, hour number two on a Tuesday, March 20th. Larry Holder, Jeff Duncan, Clyde Verdan, Dave DeCourbier, we're all here at iHeart Central. If you missed any of our number one, sports1280.com, NOLA.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube page, and Clyde will have our updates later on today on NOLA.com. And pleased to be joined by former defensive coordinator for the Saints, former interim head coach for the Saints. And, and it's something when you could be under three tenures as an assistant coach with one team. That doesn't happen very much uh, too often anymore. But pleased to be joined by Rick Venturi. Hey, hey Rick, appreciate you jumping on the show and of course a big topic here in new orleans is the passing of tom benson i know jeff reached out to you yesterday and it's as far as what he's done for this city and for this team what what is kind of your reflection on, on the time that you were able to spend uh working under tom benson uh, for so many years here in new orleans well, you know, he, he really meant the world to me and to my career. I, I came to New Orleans really in a tough situation after the Cleveland move. Um, we had gone really good and then really bad, and it was bad, you know, both team-wise and personally. And so I really, New Orleans, I always consider my resurrection point. And, you know, becoming the interim coach after eight games, I really didn't know him. He didn't know me. So it was an interesting beginning. Um, I instinctively realized uh, from the beginning, my father raised me to be a people person, and I instinctively realized that Tom was really all New Orleans, and he was a, a guy of old New Orleans where you did business man to man, and not through emails and not through notes, but you did things man to man, and I made it a point to uh, sit with him every single day uh, when I became the head coach, and you know, I did that for a lot of reasons. Most of the time, I was the listener. Most of the time, I listened to him and his opinions and his stories. Uh, but he gave me the avenue or the venue that when we did need something, you know, you just, and I realized you just couldn't walk in there uh, cold and get something like that. So it started off really good. You know, he was a financial genius. He's a demanding CEO now in every way. There's any question. You don't get successful, un, you know, unless you are. Um, you know, I've said it before, he, he really, his life epitomized the, uh, the American dream. I mean, he was after bookkeeping in New Orleans. He and Mr. Gold were selling Chevys out of a tent in the mid-50s. I, I actually went on a, on a trip with him personally to San Antonio for a, ri a rib cutting, a ribbon cutting scenario. And we talked for hours, and he explained to me their beginnings and how they got going. And Miss Grace at that time used to just laugh because she realized that the Saints were being run exactly like the Chevrolet dealership in 54. Um, but he was great to me throughout the 10 years, wonderful years I was there. Um, you know, he always treated Miss Sherry and I as a family. Uh, Miss Sherry is Italian, but I always felt like he just thought she was Cajun because she had that fire. And uh, we got along really good, and we had a special relationship, really probably more so than any normal assistant uh, for, a, for a full 10 years. Rick, and, and one of the things I pointed out in, in my, uh, I guess, my column about uh, Mr. Benson was the fact that you know, he raised the bar and the standard of the organization when he came in. He immediately hired Jim Finks and Jim Mora and immediately turned around the fortunes where the Saints used to be kind of a laughing stock under John Meekham. You know, they were always part of the football follies, uh, NFL films. And since then, except for a few years there, the Ditka, forgettable Ditka years. Right. But, right. You, you know, when you were a part of Haz's staff with Randy Mueller, since then, when I think one of the most remarkable things, since that era, 2000 on, other than the Katrina season, which I think is completely understandable and forgivable, considering the circumstances, this organization's never been worse than seven and nine. And look, you've competed in the NFL a long time. It's hard to be relevant every year. And the, the worst, when the worst you are is seven and nine, that's pretty darn good over two decades. Yeah, there, there's no question about that, you know, and, and I think you're exactly right, and I don't want to make excuses, but I do think the Katrina season was an outlier. I mean, Jim really, other than that, had one losing season. And Tom's strength, because Tom did not 
Tom really didn't know football, you know, and I, th I think he, he, he learned to know football, and I hope in some ways I educated him because we used to talk every day. Uh, but he, he knew people, and he knew success, and he demanded success. Um, and so really when you look at that hiring, and the whole thing started with Finks and Moore. There's no question about it, and particularly with Finks, because, you know, he gave him the keys to the kingdom, and Jim Finks is as good as he's ever lived. Jim's a great coach. You know, he went on and on. Uh, the interesting thing is I went through the Mora, Ditka, Hazlitt era, and the irony of that was the one thing that didn't work out was the Ditka situation. And I like Mike immensely. I love him as a man. But, you know, it just wasn't the right thing to do, and that's not what Tom was going to do. When, uh, you know, when Jim left, and uh, basically I always remember a little story. He sat down with me, and he showed me the organizational chart of the Colts. It was just, you know, right from him, right down through the GM, through Bill Kuhari, through the coach. I mean, it was the whole operation. And then he took it aside, and then he showed me a blank one with his name on top. And this was after the season when I was, like, still hanging on there. And he said, this is what I'm going to do. I mean, he was going to really blow it up. And then uh, I think Bill Kuharik and the governor and other people thought that, you know, he could salvage it with Mike. You know, and Mike had just been out of it for a long time. He wasn't surrounded by a really good cast. And so, you know, you did. You had that lull. You had that hiccup. But then Jim came in and did a fantastic job in the beginning. I mean, he and Randy Mueller, it was amazing what they were able to do in that first year, you know, after being 3-13 and 13 or whatever we were. And we stumbled. And then, of course, you know, bringing in Sean, elevating Mickey, um, you know. And then, of course, you know, the Drew Brees thing. And that, that was a little bit lucky and a little bit smart. Uh, but ever since Drew's been there, I mean, and, and Sean is a great offensive football coach. Um, and you put those two guys together, I don't think they've ever been lower than fifth offensively um, in a national football. I always said if Drew Brees would have come a year early, I still might be eating catfish at Middendorf's. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I, there's no question about that. What has changed the Saints, I think, is, you know, because there was a lull with the three, seven, and nine, there was a lull, still really good offensively, you know, but they, you know, kind of lost their way personnel-wise, which franchises do. The Colts are going through that right now. Uh, but they've been able to really shore that up. Then I, I think they had a series of quirky defensive coordinators. I'm, I'm not saying good coaches, bad coaches, but quirky guys. And I think the hiring of Allen, um, myself personally, has been the best thing that they've done. It's been one of the quietest great hires in the National Football League. Because I always said in the past few years, looking at it from a distance, is that if the Colts can just be respectable, just respectable on defense, you know, with that offense power and the coaching, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be a team that can win a Super Bowl. And um, so, I mean, all those things have happened. But Tom just, you know, in his great business and his demanding, I mean, you're not, you know, like with Jim, you know, they got into it in, uh, in San Antonio and Jim made some demands. And Tom just said, we're going on. You know, we, we are going on. And he was never, you know, never afraid to do that. But I, I think basically he let his uh, he let his uh, he let his people work, um, even though he may be tough and have some uh, strong opinions. Um, he he, uh, he 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 let his people work, and um, so you know I think that was a that was a great great strength of his. Well, Rick, uh, you've coached all over the league. You've been of course involved with Indianapolis for a while now. But I'm curious as you look back on your tenure, and you had a long tenure down here in New Orleans, are you kidding about eating, eating at Middendorf's, and, but I know you appreciated the culture. What what makes you New Orleans and the Saints, the connection, uh, maybe so unique in the NFL? Well, no, it, it's very unique. You know, New Orleans is a very unique place. It's, uh, you know, I, I like I said, if it would have been up to me, if there wouldn't have been any other circumstances, New Orleans would have become my personal home. There's no question about it. Sherry and I love it. We miss it to this day. There's a there's a, a culture to it that is uh, amazing. Uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a culture of great people uh, who have commonalities in many different ways. Um, not just you know not just football, but football is one of them. Um, it is a, and and there is there is a tremendous 
uh, relationship with the team. Even when they're upsets and losses, they're still Saints fans. You don't have people creeping in there. Uh, it's just a, a great place, and you know to see that, you know to see that comeback and that win and the Steve Gleason block, all those things. Because there's a ton of saint in me to this day. I, I, I'm going to tell you when they when that last play was scored uh, in that Minnesota game, I, I, I was as sick on even ask my wife. I was as sick on that play as I've been uh, since my coaching days. I, I, I'll be honest with you. And it took me about a week to recover because I felt like that the Saints with Breeze with Sean and that defense that was coming was the one team that could actually beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl, but inevitably Philadelphia did. But at the time, I thought that the only team that could do it would be the Saints. Well, Rick, give everybody, and of course a lot of fans here remember you during your time here, and uh, what, let everybody know what you're doing now. And I asked you, I kidded you yesterday, but you're still riding your bike. That's one of the memories I have of you always coming into the Saints practice facility on that bike. And uh, I thought you might give it up as you got a little older, but I guess not. Well, I can't give it over. You know, I got a, I got a philosophy about about aging, and you know, and it's uh, you know, aging is a process. Getting old is in your mind. So I'm I'm never going to let that happen. And I do. I ride that bike every time I can, and that's why I come down to Florida for a few months in the winter, and because uh, Indianapolis is not exactly New Orleans in the winter time. So, but you know, I ride them. I have two or three. I, I ride them all the time. I never I never lose it. Um, I really, uh, I really now established a second career. Um, when it ended in St. Louis, I was toast, to be honest with you, mentally. I, I had had 27 straight in the NFL. It didn't end pretty. Uh, I was going to retire for a year and then make a comeback. But in the meantime, I got really bored. I couldn't do it, and I started doing radio and uh, started radio in St. Louis, and then it became radio and television. And now in Indianapolis, I have a, I do an eight-month year contract, um, so I have four months to myself. But I do four-hour shows a week um, on the radio uh, from training camp until the Super Bowl. Uh, I do the color uh, on the uh, on the Saint. Oh, no, I'm sorry, I do that all the time back there, and they get me on the Colts. Um, I do the color on the uh, Colts preseason television games. And um, I have my own TV show every Sunday morning, um, in which is a really hard uh, hitting uh, football, really football, X and O football show. Uh, and I do that. That appears every Sunday morning. So, you know, like I said, it went from <laughs> something to stay busy and to dabble with to a, a really full time uh, career, Jeff. Rick Venturi joining us right here on Dunk and Holder. You mentioned Indianapolis. Uh, I think you've had plenty of things to talk about, about the Colts this offseason with oh, the, the yeah. coaching well, chaos and now the uh, the trade with the Jets. Just what do you make of the coaching chaos and what they've been doing and, of course, uh, the recent trade where now the Jets have the number three pick and the Colts have moved down? Well, I think, first of all, the coaching staff, I think they lucked out. Uh, you know, I think they were going to hire McDaniels. They were... Um, enamored with him. I never was because I had been in St. Louis when he was the offensive coordinator. I was never enamored with it. Um, he backed out of it, and uh, they had a little embarrassment for 24 hours. But sometimes you're you're saved by the move you don't make. Um, I think bringing in Frank, uh, who has a cold background, uh, who comes off of a hot Philly concept, um, is actually a plus. I, I, I think they lucked into that. Um, you know, the key things with them is, first of all, the health of Andrew Luck. Andrew Luck drives this franchise. Andrew Luck carried this franchise from 212 to the AFC Championship game in 214, and he did it without much supporting cast. You know, since that height where they got blown out by the Patriots in January of uh, 14, you know, there's been a lot of things. He's missed a lot of games with injuries. Eventually, it took its toll not supporting him, um, you know, uh, their, their roster, instead of building it, really uh, took a nosedive. They just made a lot of misses in top drafting and top free agents. They just, you know, they were aggressive, but they just evaluated poorly and ended up with a lot of minuses. So the questions are luck, obviously, number one, and then a diminished roster. That's why they've fallen off the charts in the last three years from a franchise that was 14 playoff games, 14 playoff teams out of 16. 
the trade is a no-brainer. I mean, they're going to move back to six. Uh, they're not interested in a quarterback. There's going to be three quarterbacks probably go. So with the sixth pick, you know, you're probably going to get one of the two guys that you were going to take at three. So, I, I mean, that was a no-brainer. Plus, you pick up two really high twos. They now have five picks in the top 67 players. So the biggest problem that I have is they just really are hesitant to work in the free agent market. They kind of have that philosophy that you can build through the draft. And I've always said, if you think you can only build through the draft, you need a 25-year uh, contract. Um, you know, and, and Jacksonville right now in our division is probably the state-of-the-art team that has utilized very high draft picks um, and hit on them and then have, have really signed some impact free agents. And they kind of, to me, are the um, poster child for what you really have to be. So, uh, you know, time will tell. Uh, it's amazing that two years ago, uh, Jim Ursay, who I'm very close to, was talking about multiple Lombardis, and now the word is trust the process. So <laughs> we've, we've sunk a little bit in the last two years. Rick Venturi, right here on Dunk and Holder. Rick, great insight. We really appreciate you uh, jumping on the show, and we'd love to have you jump on here at some point down the line. Absolutely, guys. Give everyone my best there, and, and my certainly my, my concerns for Tom. As I said the other day to Jeff, the heavens open, so the boss saint comes marching in or boogieing in, whatever you want to say. Definitely boogieing, there's no doubt. I've seen him boogie more, more footage of boogieing the last <laughs> week than uh, I can even recall. So, uh, Rick, great Absolutely. stuff. Absolutely. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Rick. All right. Let's Thank take you, a, guys. Yep, you Thank got you. it. Let's take a break right here on the show. Just when the Eric Decker... Arrow was going to be with the, begin with the Saints. It's already over. We have a sad trombone. I probably started this firestorm and you did. <laughs> I, mean, I didn't report it. I just said, hey, someone look into this. Someone tried to 